Anyone would think that taking care of a cemetery is a really scary job and that you would be crazy to take it, but in reality, everyone is wrong. Being a cemetery caretaker is actually a really peaceful job, perfect for someone who can't stand people too much and is not afraid of those people who are no longer alive. But you know what? One night, something terrible happened in the cemetery, something I would never expect to happen. Make no mistake, no corpse came back to life and attacked me. Oh no, something much worse happened. That day, I was right to be more afraid of the living than the dead, but of all the living people I could find in the cemetery, I didn't expect to find the worst possible living person. That night, I met Ed Gein. It was a cold, moonless night. I had finished arranging the flowers on the graves and was about to make one last round before retiring. I was walking around with my flashlight in hand, checking all the graves. I never understood why I was doing it. It was hard to imagine that some teenagers who wanted to play a joke or film a YouTube video would dare to do something to the graves. I was yawning. I was sleepy enough, and the next guard would soon replace me. Honestly, I didn't feel like going around the whole cemetery, so I turned around without finishing my round and started my journey to my security checkpoint. But suddenly, a noise caught my attention and made me look forward again. It was a dull sound, as if someone was digging. I headed towards the source of the sound, thinking it might be an animal. Sometimes a stray dog or cat would try to dig holes in the ground. But as I got closer, I realized it wasn't an animal. The noise became clearer and clearer as if someone was digging in a grave. My heart was pounding as I carefully moved forward. Many times I was told what the protocol was in case someone tried to dig up a grave, but I never thought that something like this would happen. Worst of all, there was nothing I could do but threaten to call the police. I prayed it was a dog. Maybe the noise was too loud and I was overreacting. When I reached the oldest section of the cemetery, all my hopes collapsed and I gathered the courage to face what I was seeing. There was a figure hunched over next to an open grave. A man, thin and shabbily dressed, was digging with great intensity. As in a reflexive act and without thinking about what I was doing, I pointed my flashlight in his face. Who's there? The man didn't answer me. He simply gripped his shovel tighter and started walking towards me. Each step was slow and calculated. He moved as if I couldn't see him, although he was clearly in front of me, pointed by my flashlight that was shaking in my hand. I was very afraid, and not only did he know it, but he was feeding on it to fill himself with courage and keep walking towards me. I tried to back up, but I tripped over a tombstone and fell to the ground. Before I knew it, the man was standing in front of me. You don't need to be afraid. I'm just looking for materials for a project. Not that anyone misses them. They are already dead. My mind was racing, trying to understand what was going on. This man was digging up a corpse, and he didn't seem the least bit frightened by my presence. He even seemed to be amused. As he approached me, I could feel the man slowly reach into his pocket. He was getting closer and closer to me, and as he got closer, I could see what he had in his hands. I could feel it. He was carrying a small knife. Without wasting any more time, I got up and started to run. If I had been smarter, I would have run for the exit door. But I was running so clogged up and I was so desperate that I just ran and ran without thinking about where I was going. I could hear his footsteps behind me, chasing me through the cemetery. My breathing was rapid and shallow, my heart hammering in my chest. I stumbled and fell several times, getting up quickly, driven by pure fear. No matter how far I left him behind, he was still following me. At that moment, I became aware of what I was doing and that I should head for the exit, but it was too late. I had run and run to the point that without realizing it, I had blocked the exit. I mean, I could try to go around the man and escape, but that sounded like a terrible idea. One false move and he wouldn't hesitate to use his little knife on me. I took refuge in the cemetery tool house and closed the door tightly, hoping the old padlock would hold. After a few seconds, I heard the first footsteps outside, slow and methodical. The man was close. Too close. Suddenly, I heard his voice whispering through the thin walls. I know you're in there. Stop behaving so immaturely and come out. I won't do anything to you. I just want to talk. My body trembled uncontrollably. I looked for something to defend myself with and found an old shovel. I gripped it tightly, knowing it was my only hope. All I could do at that moment was wait and wait. Outside, I heard absolutely nothing. Was he still there, waiting for me? Had he gotten bored and left? Had he dug up the body again? 
I looked at my hands and realized that I was shaking uncontrollably. I was so scared. I didn't want to die. No training had prepared me for this. I didn't even care about protecting the corpses in this place. This job was just something I did to earn some money. I was never told that this could happen to me. Gathering what little courage I had left, I slowly opened the door and stepped out. I looked around, searching for any sign of the man. The cemetery felt darker than ever. Was it always so foggy? I couldn't remember. I looked around, but saw no sign of the man. I knew he was probably still nearby. I... I had to leave the place as soon as possible. I had to run. I had to escape. There was no way that if that man found me, he would have only tried to talk. I walked very carefully. I was still shaking, and my legs buckled with every little step I took. I headed towards the main entrance. The plan was to grab my things and leave. Luckily, I had everything ready. However, just as I was about to cross the exit, he appeared out of nowhere, blocking my path. You should have stayed hidden. As soon as I heard his voice, the man jumped on top of me. My shovel fell off immediately, and before I knew it, I was on the ground, straining at the man's hand to keep him from stabbing me with the knife. This man had a lot of strength. I was not going to be able to resist much longer. The knife began to slowly descend on my skin, resting on it and slowly penetrating my shoulder. Ah! Suddenly, a man grabbed my attacker and threw him away from me. In that second, I could look at his face. It was the night shift guard. Hey, are you okay? Before I could answer him, the man lunged at the other security guard and in the middle of the onslaught. He stopped next to him and plunged the knife into the center of his chest. The man fell to the ground while his assassin began to plunge the knife in and out of him over and over again. I took advantage of this moment to flee. I covered the wound on my shoulder with my hand and ran as fast as I could, leaving behind my things and even my car. As I ran, I heard his footsteps getting closer and closer. My body was exhausted, but fear drove me on. Finally, I saw the lights of a car in the distance. With a last-ditch effort, I ran toward the road, waving my arms frantically. The car stopped and the driver, seeing me covered in mud and blood, opened the door without asking questions. I slumped into the seat and asked him to speed up, but a man was chasing me and was trying to attack me. When we got far enough away, the driver, an older man who seemed to care a lot about me, immediately called the police as he drove me to the nearest hospital. I passed out before I could explain what had happened. When I woke up, I was able to tell everything that had happened. When the police arrived at the cemetery, they found neither the other guard nor our attacker, but when they saw the blood on the ground, I knew that what I told them was true. I didn't know anything about that man until many years later when I saw him in a newspaper. That man's name was Ed Gein, and he had been arrested and charged with murdering two women. Although the murders of those women were terrifying, the worst he did to the dead. The man had a fascination with the digging up corpses, and once he did it, I can only tell you that the things he did to them were terrible. As soon as I saw him, I decided to tell my truth to the authorities, but there was not enough evidence to convict him for that, but for what he did to those poor women. Happily, life punished this psychopath as it was meant to, and he died of lung cancer a few years later. Ed Gein, known as the Butcher of Plainfield, was a murderer and grave robber who operated in the 1950s in Wisconsin. He stole corpses from cemeteries and used them to make macabre objects, and was also responsible for at least two murders. His behavior inspired horror characters in such films as Psycho and Silence of the Innocents. Gein was captured in 1957 after police found human remains in his home. He was declared mentally incompetent and spent the rest of his life in a psychiatric hospital, where he died in 1984. Hello, my name is Javier. I'm an ordinary old man, one of those who have many stories to tell. Unlike other people my age, I'm a horror movie lover. I don't think anything can scare me, <laughs> make no mistake. Some movies are horrifying, but how can I be scared of something I see on a screen when I met one of the most terrifying and cruel serial killers in history? It was on a day like any other, or so I thought when I woke up. I was working as a maintenance technician, and that morning I had been assigned to check the electrical systems of an old church in Wichita. The task was simple, and I thought I would be back home for dinner. I couldn't have been more wrong. I arrived at the church shortly before noon. 
It was a dreary place with the windows broken and the musty smell permeating the air. I went to the basement where I had been informed that the main switches were located. As I walked through the corridors, I heard a strange noise like shuffling feet. I thought it might be an animal and didn't think much of it. But when I reached the basement, I saw a tall, thin man dressed in work clothes, checking something on the floor. My first instinct was to say hello, although his face looked very familiar. Hi, I'm the technician. Do you work here? Of course. I've been trying to fix this on my own to impress the technician when he comes, but I guess you're the technician and I haven't fixed it yet. <laughs> I guess I failed. No worries. This is more difficult than it looks. I see. <laughs> Need help? Nah, oh, thanks. This won't take long. As far as I can see, I'll just have to touch a few little things. Sure, go ahead. This place is a mess. At that moment, I didn't feel that anything was wrong. This was all just routine work. I wasn't surprised that the man was still behind me, either. I had been doing this job too long not to know that people were always staring out of curiosity or to check that I was doing my job right. What I did not expect was what the man said to me at that moment. Let me ask you a question, just out of curiosity. You really don't know who I am? Well, now that you say it, you look familiar. Are you famous or something? <laughs> I don't know if I'm famous, but I'd like to be one day. Oh yeah? <laughs> then why is your face so familiar? You probably saw me on TV. There's been some news about me. My name is Dennis Rader. Are you familiar? Um, actually, yes. Although I don't remember from where... I'm also known as BTK. That was the only information I needed. At that moment, I remembered his face. That man was Dennis Rader, a dangerous serial killer wanted for torturing and killing several people. I tried to pretend I didn't recognize him, but it was too late. My face had already given me away. Oh, you seem to remember now. I remained silent, frozen in my position, not knowing what to do. I didn't see his face, I didn't react to his words, nothing. In a quick movement, I threw the tool I had in my hand and ran as fast as I could from the place. I had gained some advantage, he could no longer catch up with me. I got to the basement door and tried to open it, but it was locked. I hit and kicked it as hard as I could, but it wouldn't open. Had someone locked it? Was someone helping Raider? Suddenly I felt an impact on my head, and my vision became less clear. I could hardly notice I was on the ground, passed out. When I opened my eyes, it felt like several hours had passed. There was a window near me, but it was covered. The moonlight was coming through the broken walls of the church. It was already night. I felt a sharp pain in my head. I tried to move, but discovered to my horror that I was tied to a metal chair with leather straps, immobilized. At that moment, I remembered what had happened. The place smelled of dampness and blood. <laughs> Around me, four more people were tied up, their faces reflecting the same terror I felt. A woman was crying softly while an older man was mumbling prayers, his voice barely audible. He seemed very weak. I didn't have time to scan the rest of the room when I heard the door open. Behind it, in walked a man wearing a butcher's apron and latex gloves, carrying a toolbox which he rattled as he set it down on a surgical table in the center of the room. I already knew the man. It was Dennis Raider, the BTK killer. Raider looked at us with an unsettling calmness, as if he was simply about to do something he always did. His voice was as kind and friendly as in our previous encounter, but this time there was something different, a kind of mocking tone that I didn't feel before. Welcome, my toys. Today's a special day. Do you know why? Please let us go. We haven't done anything to you. This is inhumane. Exactly what the girl said. Today is a special day because today, you will know the true meaning of pain. My heart was pounding. I didn't understand how I got here, but I had to free myself. Somehow I had to get out of this place. I tried to get out of the chair, but the straps were too tight. Raider approached me, pulling a small knife from his box. He pressed it against my neck, not cutting just enough for me to feel the coldness of the metal. You, the one who didn't recognize me, you are the first. With a swift movement, Raider grabbed a pair of large tweezers and held them in front of my eyes. I was so scared that I was peeing myself with fear. I wasn't even resisting anymore. I was surrendered, ready for whatever he was going to do to me. Meanwhile, Raider had a big smile on his face. 
he was enjoying my fear. New guy, pain is a powerful tool. It teaches us things and makes us human. Today, I will teach you the value of true pain. Immediately, the psycho started using the tweezers on my nails, ripping them off one by one. Ah, the sound of suffering. It's like a symphony to my ears. Every scream, every tear is a tribute to my art. The pain was unbearable. My screams echoed in the room, but Raider seemed to be having the time of his life. You know, every time I break someone, I discover something new about them. It's fascinating to see how much the body can take before it gives up. He paused for a moment, his cold gaze shifting to the other prisoners. Anyone else willing to volunteer? If not, I'll choose. The young man to my right began to beg for his life, tears streaming down his face. He pulled a hammer from his toolbox and slowly approached a young woman. The girl had a gag in her mouth, and she began to cry as Raider approached her. Without saying a word, he smashed the sledgehammer into her skull. The girl was dizzy with a blank stare, very confused. After the first blow, Raider gave her another, and another, and another blow. Her head was completely shattered, but even so, he had the impression that she was alive, out of her mind. The sound of bones breaking is one of my favorites. It's so satisfying, you know? I wanted to give you a real exhibition. I wanted to use different weapons to kill everyone here. In fact, I had a knife. Look at it. But there's something about the hammer that I just like. Raider approached the man who was praying before. As soon as he saw the assassin, the man closed his eyes and went back to praying. My stomach churned as he raised the hammer, and just before he lowered it, I closed my eyes. At that moment, the man stopped praying and started screaming. The screaming got louder and louder, but all of a sudden they started to get quieter, until there was only silence. There were still more people in the room, but Raider turned to me, his face splattered with blood. I closed my eyes again. I knew this would hurt. I waited and waited for the hammer to blow to the head, just as it did with the others, but instead, I received it in the knee. The pain was excruciating. I felt the bone in my knee break into a thousand pieces. It was such a pain that I don't know how to describe it as if your knee was made out of glass and it was breaking. I couldn't even assimilate the pain in my knee when the man attacked my other knee, and I screamed even louder. Instead of continuing to attack me, Raider leaned close to my ear and whispered something to me. I need you to get out of here and tell everyone what you saw. Now I'll let you escape and pretend I'm not seen you, but when I'm done with the remaining ones, I'll turn around and look for you. Drag yourself to the exit now. I don't know what I'll be capable of when I run out of people to kill. With that said, Raider released me from the chair and I fell to the ground. I crawled desperately and humiliated to the exit. As I did so, I could not bring myself to look back, but I felt the blows of the hammer impacting human flesh. I left the church and headed for my car. I called 911 and told them everything that had happened. They told me to wait in line and that they were on their way, but it could take a while since I was in the middle of nowhere. I tried to stay on the phone with them, but after a few minutes, I closed my eyes and passed out. When I opened my eyes, I woke up in a hospital. The cops immediately interrogated me, asking me everything I had experienced. When they arrived, Raider was gone, but the bodies of the victims remained in the same place where the psychopath had left them. The police were not able to catch Raider until 20 years later, in 2005. When they did, he confessed to only 10 crimes, which did not include the church people. I considered denouncing him, but it no longer made sense. The man was sentenced to 10 life sentences. Justice had been served. As for me, I could never recover from what he did to my knees. Today I watch as many horror movies as I can, and nothing resembles the things I saw or felt with BTK. I'm really sick of watching movies, but not being able to walk without a wheelchair takes all my will to go out on the street to do anything for myself. Justice may have punished Raider, but nothing will give me the life I lost. This man may have let me go free, but I feel like I died that night. This story is based on Dennis Raider, known as the BTK Killer, short for Bind, Torture, Kill. This man was a serial killer who terrorized Wichita, Kansas between 1974 and 1991, killing 10 people. To this day, we live in doubt whether he actually killed more people or just says so to play psychological games with the police. 
In 2005, Rader was captured after resuming communication with police and being traced through a diskette he sent. He confessed to his crimes and was sentenced to 10 consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. He is currently serving his sentence in a maximum security prison.